I want to start by going off script a little bit, which is always one of the things that makes some people worry when the preacher does that. And I wonder if there's anybody here who counts as a kid or thinks of him or herself as a kid who would answer a question for me. Anybody? <laughs> I think we'll look for someone else first and use you as our backup, perhaps. Is there anybody who knows what's in the middle of the flowers? What's in the middle of the flowers this morning? Anybody can just shout it out? It's a lion, that's right. Why do you think that today, you know, today is, the, the, is the feast of Christ the King? We remember Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Why do you think we have a lion in the middle of the flowers on the feast of Christ the King? Any guesses? I see a hand. Yes, please. Lions eat a lot. Well, that may be true. <laughs> Wasn't quite what I was hoping for. Yes, madam. So I can't hear. I still didn't quite hear what Rosie said. The Bible story. There are Bible stories about lions. That's true. Why do? What do we call the lion? What do we call the lion? Maybe I can help this along a little bit here. Yes, sir. The king of the jungle. The king of beasts. That's right. I think of Jesus as being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The lion is beautiful and powerful, doesn't have too many enemies, is, is, is able to live his life in peace for the most part. Maybe that's why, you think? We're thinking maybe, go away and chewing on kids and not just kids, about why it is that maybe there's a lion in the flowers today on the Feast of Christ the King. Just a thought. It's certainly a happier thought than what I want to talk to the grown-ups about this morning, which is how over the last few Sundays we've been hearing these pretty dire stories about people and the choices that they make. Bridesmaids who didn't have enough oil and wedding guests who came wearing the wrong clothes and slaves or servants or employees, whoever they were, who were made their employer's investment manager and were told to do something with his money. And all of them are judged by the choices that they make. It sounds like, in many cases, they didn't make very good choices. That ought to be weighing on you and me just a little bit, that perhaps we're going to be judged for our choices, too. And suddenly, we have the last Sunday of the season of Pentecost, and the lesson we hear today, where absolutely everybody in the world will be judged for the choices that we all make. Now, at least today, it's a little clearer what those choices are about. We can read through the lesson and see. It is about, apparently about dealing with the actual needs of the people who are around us, recognizing their hunger and their thirst and their loneliness and doing something about it. Now, if that's all you need to hear this morning, that's all you can hear this morning, go away and be blessed if you recognize that somehow in the words of Jesus, we learn that if we will do those things, God will count it as, as, as worthy service. Somehow, in, in meeting the needs of our fellow human beings, we are doing godly work. And here I can insert a little commercial. Today, in the course of the monthly breakfasts that we have for different ministries in the church. Today happens to be the day for pastoral care and outreach. If you go into the parish hall after church, you'll find posters there that talk about the different things that pastoral care and outreach do, and you'll find that they are meeting the practical needs of other people. And in fact, in often very small, simple, not very, not very strenuous way. So, I encourage you to go in there after church, have a look, talk to somebody who does that work now. Maybe there's something in there that you're being called to do also. Maybe that is what this lesson today is calling you to do, to send a birthday card to somebody, for heaven's sake. It is no more complicated than that. So if that's all you need this morning, and certainly that is much of what the church has taught using this lesson through the centuries, all very well. If you're willing to go a little deeper, I think there is more in the story 
for us to think about and to chew on today. I notice that the sheep and the goats both respond to the king in the same way. When did we ever do that? We, 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 had, we had no idea. We were, they both seem to be befuddled by the, the things that they're told that they did or didn't do. Now, I'm pretty sure that the sheep did, in fact, do something. They, they didn't seem to have a plan for how it was going to go, but they did at least do it right in the beginning. They formed a committee and had meetings and set up a volunteer schedule and got a Costco card so they could buy peanut butter and paper towels in bulk and they arranged with other organizations to work with them so they had coverage all, all year. They did those things that we do. But I'm not sure, indeed, I don't think that they went out thinking, we are going to do this because later the king is going to tell us that we were doing it for that person. I think instead they went out intending to be followers of Jesus and then looked for ways to make that real in their lives. If nothing else, they were finding how the, the, being a follower of Jesus looked to them as they went through their days and through their years. How are we doing with that? How are we doing with being followers of Jesus? Today, when we come to the Sunday called the Feast of Christ the King, it's a little hard for us as Americans, I think, to get our minds around that idea. We don't follow a king. We spent our early history running a king off. We spent most of the rest of our history trying to run off anybody else who had any pretensions of being a king. We think of ourselves as being citizens, not as being followers, much less as being subjects. And yet if we go back far enough in history, we find that in reality, kings and queens, for that matter, in, in much of human history have been more heads of families than they have been political leaders. Early kings were leaders of, of extended families, people who were related in some way, not always necessarily by blood, sometimes by experience. And right down to this day, we find there are situations where someone is called the king of the fill in the name of the people rather than the king of some geographical area. If you think about it, dear friends, we are related by blood to Jesus. Again, not in a literal sense. We're not his literal descendants. And yet, we are his relations. We are his family in a, an extended and in mystical sort of way. What does that mean when we come to do what it is that we do day by day and week by week? I want to suggest to you that it means that when we go out as members of that family of Jesus, we have to know why we're doing it. Periodically when I talk about evangelism and I begin to get the panic looks from people, I'll try to soften the edges on it a little bit by saying, well, evangelism is really when we go out and do things for people and they will know that we are Christians by our love. Any children of the 70s here can now hear that song in their head, I'm sure. <laughs> but once or twice when I've tried that line on people, I have gotten pushback and people have said, well, but how are they going to know that Jesus deserves the credit for it? How will they know whose family we belong to? Because there are many nice people, many good people in the world who go out and do the same sorts of things that we read in the lesson this morning, but who are not Christian. How will anyone know that we are passing out our peanut butter sandwiches because we are followers of Jesus and not simply because we are nice people? It's hard to make that choice in the moment, dear friends when the need arises to say, well, why are you doing this? And answer the question, it's important already to know what our answer is going to be. Going into those situations, knowing who we are and whose we are is really, really important. I can tell you why. I, I have my own personal example. It's not a flattering story about myself. At my last church, our church was on Main Street. And on the weekend of Thanksgiving, on Sunday night, there was what was called the Parade of Lights. 
where everybody put lights all over their, their car or their truck or a float that they made, and they all went down Main Street with the bands and Santa on a fire truck, all the usual stuff in small town beginning of the Christmas season. We decided we're right there on Main Street. We've got to be part of this somehow. So we decided we would give away coffee and donuts. So on that night, I went down to the bottom of the driveway by the church in my clergy costume and gave away coffee and donuts. And many people came by and they were very grateful and we had nice conversations. But at some point that night, two young ladies came up and began talking to me and the other people who were standing around. And they were very nice. In fact, they were nicer than the average person who comes up to you on the street. Now, say it was dark, so I really couldn't see them completely clearly. But it became apparent in the course of their conversation and their niceness, they were going to try to tell me about Jesus. <laughs> I'm standing there in my clergy getup in front of a church, having just told them that I'm the priest of that church, and they're going to tell me about Jesus. It was only then that I saw the Mormon missionary badges. And I knew why they were going to try to tell me about Jesus. It also became apparent to me that they really were prepared for this. They had come into this encounter knowing who they were, whose they were, and what they were about. They had their visiting cards in their pocket. They had a little iPad with a beautiful video that the LDS church had made about Jesus and Christmas and doing nice things for people. They were ready in a way that I was not when I came into that encounter. How important it is always to know who we are, whose we are, and what we are about in order to be able to represent, as the modern expression has it, in situations like that. So how do we do that? Well, it's important that each of us does that individually. We, we need to be aware of who we are individually as followers of Jesus and who we, when we go to the post office, the bank, the, the grocery store, out in traffic, anywhere we happen to be, the situation may arise that we need to give an account of our faith, as it says in the prayer book. But it's also about all of us together. Notice in the story this morning that the king speaks to the sheep as a group and to the goats as a group. There's something about how we do this together that's important too how we together represent who it is that we are, whose it is that we are, and what it is that we are about in this place. How do we do that? I want to suggest to you that it begins with prayer. That may seem like a truism and obvious, but how often do we really pray together intentionally for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? for the presence of God right here in our midst to guide us as God would guide us. We do it every Sunday in a way. We do it every Wednesday in a way. How important is it that we recognize what this time is that we spend together? Not just the time to come together to sing songs and listen to a speech, but really to pray as a group, to recognize the presence of God in our midst to be guided and transformed by it. So I encourage you, pray together. Whenever we are together, recognize what it is that we're doing. And beyond that, to begin to look for those signs, to begin to hear that message, to begin to work out in our lives, as apparently the sheep were doing, what it is God is calling us to do. You received a letter about a month ago from myself and from the wardens about a new initiative in this respect, a new beginning in thinking about who we are and whose we are in the eyes of God and in the eyes of our community. Perhaps it was a little unclear from the letter what the, the meaning of that was, but I, as your spiritual leader, look at it very much in that way. Meetings that we will have in January and February before our annual meeting in March and then other meetings to follow that because you can never have too many meetings, beloved, <laughs> will help us begin to say that more clearly, to say out loud who we are, and to look for where it is that God is calling us to proclaim that in our community now. So I encourage you, pray about those meetings. Attend those meetings. Come with an open heart and an open mind 
and help in that process. Every one of us brings a little spark of the Holy Spirit to that work. And together we can discover what it is God is calling us to do. So, dear friends, as we come to the end of the church's year, this is New Year's Eve in the church's eyes. Next Sunday begins a new year. Let's make that our resolution to pray and work together now to know who we are and whose we are and what it is that God is calling us to do now in this place. If we will do that, regardless of the outcome, regardless of where it may lead us, we can be confident that when the king comes, we will give a good account of what we have been doing and find ourselves on the right side of God, literally aware that we have been the sheep who have done the good work of God in this place. Amen.